right, my pleasure right now to be joined with a uh, talented writer. You've been reading his stuff for a while now with the Times Pick Union and currently with The Athletic, uh, Brody Miller. Brody, thanks for stopping by, man. Oh, thanks for having me as always, man. Uh, and Brody, I just want a quick endorsement for The Athletic, uh, compliment <laughs> the, the work you guys do. It is, um, there's time and uh, work invested in these articles. You're not slapping stuff together in a half hour. So uh, I appreciate uh, I, the advertisement, my friend. Yeah. yeah. Don't, well, don't subscribe a, for me. Subscribe for the hundreds of reporters you'd be getting access to. That's my always my, my pitch. That's right. That's right. And I, I do subscribe, and I will guarantee anybody out there, you'll get more than what you pay for uh, in, in terms of content. So, so Brody, uh, this past weekend in Tiger Stadium, LSU plays Arkansas. And if there's ever a case of um, a game is being close and goes into overtime does not mean it's a thrilling ball game. Uh, it was, uh, it was this one. I, if you were at one point in the stands and a bit bored and cold, I would not uh, come down on you too harshly. Uh, I think I counted Brody LSU had the ball 14 times. Arkansas had the ball 15 times and there were two touchdowns scored in the game. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, another tough loss for LSU and kind of uh, fans scratching their head on uh, the management of LSU's quarterbacks. Yeah, it was, a, like you said, a pretty ugly game. You know, I think it, some credit to both defenses, Arkansas with, you know, defense coordinator Barry Odom has been one of the better DCs in football for a little while now. And Durante Jones has things going really good right now for LSU's defense. But at the same time, yeah, there were a lot of frustrating things with LSU's offense, you know. And obviously they handed over to a true freshman, you know, 18, 19-year-old quarterback in Garrett Nussmeyer where, yeah, you, you expect growing pains there. You don't hand it to a guy who – his whole selling point is he's really exciting, but he's raw, right? That was the whole thing. You can't yeah. hand it to him and then expect it to be some perfectly polished product. And I think, I think you saw a bit of both, right? You saw that incredible 29 yard touchdown pass spinning out of a sack. That is what you want Garrett Nussmeyer for. And then you also saw a guy who, you know, made some mistakes through two interceptions. You know, the offense didn't quite have the same, even if Johnson can't make the big plays Nussmeyer has, I think he can get the offense in a little more rhythm, you know, like things like that. There's, there's, pros and cons to both guys but I think I think Ed Ogeron came out pretty frustrated just with some of the the play calling the first down issues things like that that I think have plagued LSU for this entire season yeah Brody um and we, I just came back from some of the player interviews and I do want to play up at least one big positive Damone Clark and Micah Baskerville have become a dynamic duo at linebacker the tackles they're racking up tremendous but kind of what you just mentioned um this and, and look Jake Pete's has forgotten more football than we'll ever know. And I, I can't explain what a five technique is and a four, whatever all that stuff is. Okay. I just watched the ball in the game and everything. All right. But uh, coach O has had a track record of LSU of him and his offensive coordinator. It just not getting along. I mean, I go back to Matt Canada. I remember uh, Brody, were you, were you at that bowl game, Notre Dame? That was my, the year before I came. Yep. Okay. That's before my time. Well, I remember showing up there and the story had just broke. Matt Canada won't be back next year. And then Matt Canna says at the interviews in Orlando, well, I'd love to come and coach next year if I can, and that'll be an awkward. And so this year, too, it just seems like, Brody, every post-game press conference, well, I wish we would have had a better plan. I wish we would have done this. I wish we would have done that. And you and I, we don't interview Jake Peets because they don't. we don't interview coordinators at LSU, so he hasn't said anything. But th this has just not worked at all with him. It, it hasn't, and it's tough, right? I think – I understood the thinking of the hire, right? It was, hey, you want to get young again. You want to get forward thinking again. And of course, we can. We all know there was a heavy emphasis on getting back to Joe Brady's offense for 2019. And yeah, maybe there was a little naivete with how kind of literally they went back to Joe Brady's offense, you know, hiring two guys from his staff and all that who hadn't been play callers. And again, like you said, I'm not down on Jake Pete's forever, right? I think he's a young guy, first time play callers, figuring some things out. But it is pretty tough when you are a coach who, especially in hindsight, was on a hot seat going into the season, had pressure, and you are handing your team to two coordinators who had never really called plays at this level before. That is risky. That, there is a challenge there. And then, yeah, I think, you know, you, you could even really go back to you can go back to UCLA, but especially the Auburn game, even before Ogeron was fired, that, you know, coming out and pretty much saying like, hey, man, we can't get a play called down. And they're trying to change the line of scrimmage. He's been kind of pretty early on you know criticizing Jake Pete sometimes and putting some blame on him and and hey I actually respect the heck out of Ogeron's comment yesterday that kind of said like you know hey I'm a lame duck you know there's no bus like I, I can I can say what I want and I respect that that's fair but it is it has been pretty clear that he's had frustrations with Jake Pete yeah 
That was a heck of a press conference yesterday, uh, Brody. We got a uh, Herm Edwards impersonation. Yeah. You play to win the game. We play to win the game. You got that? You got uh, the comment about uh, I'm a lame duck coach. I can say things like that now. Um, he made a uh, throwing under the bus reference to. Uh, yeah. Uh, about uh, there's no bus where I live. I don't throw whatever that means or whatever. But um, so, yeah, the, the, the press conference Monday. And to go back to the that LSU-Auburn game you talked about, I think LSU called 14 or 15 passing plays in a row during that Auburn game. Uh, at least you have to run the ball here and there, right? Even if you're getting stuff for a two yard loss, those defensive linemen uh, can't know that they can just tee off on your quarterback all night. So that was right. absolutely. Yeah. It was just so unprecedented for LSU of all schools, the place that had a coach fired because he wouldn't stop running the ball. So old school, you know, to, to be the program that in that Auburn game, like you're saying, couldn't run the ball. And a lot of it, offensive line problems were real but still you talk to a lot of people in the program there were people saying hey Jake Pete's just he's a smart guy and he's really smart with the passing stuff people do believe that but he just maybe the running game isn't his comfort zone and and people would point out hey 2019 yeah threw a lot but it was the run setting up the pass and the pass setting up the run it all it was a cohesive system that all worked in tandem and that's where I think there's a difference between being you know a smart guy and a guy who knows how to run a whole scheme right or at least yet and I think with Jake Pete's there's just an element of you know maybe he doesn't know how to put all the pieces together yet maybe he doesn't know how to use the run to set up the pass and vice versa and he just wasn't comfortable with that yet I think that's a lot of the things I've heard within the program it's not that he's like some dumb ignorant guy I'm sure one day he will be a good OC but there he's just still learning that stuff for sure and Brody, if Tyron Davis Price catches the snap, right, and rolls out and maybe throws a pass for a touchdown or runs it in for a touchdown, we say, what a great play call. What a what a change of pace. What a curveball to throw in there. But, man, it just seemed, you know, Nussmeyer hit a couple of passes. He's in the yep. groove. He's warming up, and you take him out. What 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 are we doing? And and they haven't run that play, as Coach O talked about, after the game on Monday. They haven't run that all year long. I asked him twice about the play. Did they feel confident that had they been practicing this? Not enough. And uh, it, it's got to be the, the play of the game looking back on it as far as the, the whole momentum shifting. Yeah. And credit to you for getting those answers out of him, by the way. But <laughs> yeah, it was it was a situation where and I think that's what makes these last two weeks so difficult for LSU fans is that, yeah, I mean, this season's already kind of off the rails anyway. What does it matter? Right. But still, it's that idea that two weeks in a row, a depleted team, a team that is you know, tw- I think I think I count at this point 12 real starters out at this point, and you know, so m- coaches fired, all that stuff, and to see them still come out and play as hard as they have, really in impressive fashion, and be in control of both these games. Not maybe not control in Alabama, like Alabama still in theory outplayed them, but like four chances to win that game straight up, and they gave it away. And then this game, to your point about that play. They were in control. Like they were completely outplaying Arkansas. And then you make that choice. And again, I am with you. If that play works, we are praising them. You know, the, I think that's the hardest part about our job is that like, what about the seven times that something does work or doesn't work? And it's all reaction based, it's all reactionary instead of proactive. But still, yeah. that call, all of a sudden, it changes the entire game. It's a risk when maybe you didn't need a risk, I think is maybe the point a lot of people would make. And then you put that in situation, everything just changes. You're, uh, whether or not you believe in momentum or not, you are handing something back to to Arkansas there. Now they're feeding off that, and the game just changed. They didn't lose the game just because of that play. A lot of mistakes happened, but that changed the outcome where you could have been up 17-3 or even 13-3, and now it's a completely different game, and that's hard to take back. Yeah, no doubt, Brody. It was it was a bit of a self-destruct button, you know, uh, on LSU's part there. And, um, and, and look, I didn't see the effort at Alabama coming. The way they played in that game yep. was tremendous. They go in a 30-point underdog, and people are telling me that that's not enough, that Alabama's going to win by 50 or whatever. And they had a chance, man, to win the game. And, uh, and, and we're hanging with Alabama there. So, um, and, and Coach O says that Max Johnson's still the starter moving forward. we got two games left in this, in this season. Um, it just seemed like they were just going to get as much of a look at, at Garrett Nussmeyer as they could. And like you said, he – he brings certain things like in overtime within a three play period, you see him on a third and 20, yeah. just rifle a laser in the neighbors and then uh, throw a fade. It reminded me, I think of Jarrett Lee, 2008 against Alabama in overtime. They turned the ball over. LSU got the ball first. Alabama wins it in overtime that year. But the coach O again said, well, that was the play that was called. He threw it where he was you know, supposed to. So once again, kind of directing a little shade towards the OC and the play call, but, 
But uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, Garrett Nussmeyer, a true freshman, uh, he's doing his best. And, and to his credit, went, to, went, for, went, went in front of the media and answered questions afterwards about his mistakes and everything. So, Absolutely, yeah. Garrett Nussmeyer, I, I understand the criticism, but I, I was kind of blown away by fans and, and even, you know, some people in our field that I respect that were tweeting, you know, Nussmeyer isn't it. And, hey, I'm not saying you played great Saturday, but I kind of – boggled my mind there you can beat that fans can make a reaction that strongly after a teenager playing one less than one full football game it kind of surprised me because he did a lot of impressive stuff he showed the things that if coached correctly over the next two or three years if he can get you know harnessed well enough could be a superstar like he does special things he's just raw and I think that's okay and also the funniest part about all this is that and I'm somebody who's written at length about how hey he's gonna make risky choices that's how he played that's his best trade and his worst trade but the one that lost the game wasn't a risky pass, right? Like the first interception, absolutely. He was trying to thread a needle, couldn't get it there, picked off. Shouldn't have done that. The interception, and then you put it well yourself, that was a called fade in the corner. It, it was a one-on-one -on -one coverage. It's not like he was fitting a ball that shouldn't have been in a tight spot or something like that. He made the throw to a one-on-one. -on -one. That's what you're kind of supposed to do. And he just underthrew it. That's not something he does often, quite frankly. So it's just, again, like, I'm not saying he played well. I'm not trying to do that. But right. it's just sometimes the things we highlight aren't always 100% contextual. Like, it was just a bad throw. It wasn't a mistake of that tells us who he's going to be as a quarterback. So I saw enough to still think Aaron Usmeyer is a great future. I also very much understand that, hey, you know, if it's a close situation – and you still can keep the red shirt if possible. And Max Johnson is maybe more stable. Yeah, I totally understand going to Johnson too. They're both solid quarterbacks in tough situations and a very flawed offense. Yeah, and Brody, it, whoever moving forward is going to be compared to Joe Burrow. And yeah. the, the Joe Burrow LSU got was uh, kind of growing into being uh, an adult. He was, what, 22, 23. Yep. LSU didn't get the Joe Burrow, who was a freshman who – I think Joe Burrow joked at Heisman, my Ohio State teammates told me they should revoke my scholarship, that I didn't even belong being on the team or something like that. And so there's there's that. And, um, you know, I remember, Brody, if we go all the way back to August, like those, you and I both know when we get these stats from the scrimmage scrimmages that they give us, like, what, what should I make of this? Real quick, Christian Lockinger told me a funny story one time, Brody. He said, we had totally stuffed the LSU offense that day. We had a huge day. We sacked Brandon Harris, Anthony Jennings, who was playing quarterback. And his mom calls and says, oh, how was the scrimmage? Oh, mom, we dominated. Well, that's not what I'm reading here on LSU sports.net. And, uh, you know, LSU rushed for 250. They threw for 250. And Chris is like, that is not what happened. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, that is actually a great way to put it, 100%. Uh, so we always get those stats in August. And it's like, well, what do I make? But back in August, we were getting these stats of Nussmeyer. And we're just like, did he really throw for 350 in the scrimmage and 400 and Max threw for 150? And so what do we make of this? So anyway, that, that that's the Nussmar thing has been bubbling underneath the surface for a while now. And yeah. so at least now we got a chance to see a little bit of what, what, what he is in a game. So, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and yeah, even the scrimmage thing, it's not, it's not fake or real, right? It's somewhere in the middle where Garrett Nussmeyer is probably a player who is you know, just by his skill set is made to look amazing in a scrimmage, right? Like, it's just a different thing. You're not really getting hit. You're going against by the second team. Like, you were probably put on earth to look amazing in a scrimmage. <laughs> and, and that's not an insult toward him. It's just, you know, it's, you know, if you excuse it a little bit. So, yeah, yeah, I think, and, but I even heard during camp before the season started, you know, offensive coaches telling me, hey, that guy's going to be really special, but he takes off running too soon sometimes. And he, you know, tries to make some throws like Johnny Menzel. And that's, that's something that'll get coached out of him. Well, not coached completely out, but, you you know harnessed yeah. and and that's all I, I it's like sometimes the good and the bad are fine line and that just it's growth because like you said burrow was when he was 19 was not ready to play at ohio state and he would tell you that he wasn't even even fourth year burrow at ohio state wasn't i mean at lsu wasn't exactly an elite quarterback these things take time you know so it's just uh i'm not saying he's going to be a superstar but it also just saying he's 19 give him time so, Brody, here we are. There's two games left in the regular season. Uh, two years after, uh, you know, covering the 2019 team, which was like every day, like personally, professionally, was like exciting. Like uh, press conferences, the coaches show, the practices. Like there was this electricity every day when you go over there. And now you're hoping to make the Gasparilla Bowl or, uh, you know, the Liberty Bowl or one of these to win the last two games. I, I do think they're going to give a real spirited effort against AM. I just have that feeling that that final game is going to be a war. Like, 
the whole Jimbo factor and all that, but, yep. uh, and Ed Ogeron's, um, you know, final regular season game. And, and I've heard, I don't want to get myself in trouble, uh, but at the press conference, I asked him, will you coach a bowl game? He said, yes. I've heard some conflicting things about whether yeah. he would coach a bowl game or not as well. So we'll see how that goes. But, uh, but man, this season, uh, it just started with so much excitement at the Rose bowl. I think 20, 25,000 LSU fans go out there. And, uh, I'm thinking Brody, I mean, Head to head in power five games, LSU's two and six, right? I mean, McNeese and Central Michigan, if you throw those two out. So, how many days have LSU fans been happy this year? Uh, you know, twice? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's been a dark year in a lot of ways. And, and you know, as well as I, it's not even just about the wins and losses, it's just so much going on around this entire program. You know, the off the field issues, the, the drama, the, the, the players leaving or injuries and things like that, there's just very little to cling to. And I mean, there's a lot of talent on this roster that fans should be excited about a lot in the future that I think can be turned around relatively smoothly. Like it's not all bleak, probably about to get a really exciting coach that I'm sure we'll talk about later, but at the same time, yeah, it, it's just been a, a wild year. I mean, you've been covering this far longer than I, but you know, the in most of this, you know, quote unquote golden era, these last 21 years, the down years are, you know, eight and four, you know, or nine and three. Those are the down years. It's an incredibly stable program these 21 years. So for these, this last uh, year and a half, it's just kind of mind boggling to see a team that had been at the top and now are just no longer well run and not even just like it's, it's, that's what's so crazy. The talents there, the so many, the resources are there and they are just not prepared. They are not on top of things there. There's just a poor culture. There's, you know, just the practices aren't right. You know, just so much yeah. is not quite going right that it's it's hard to wrap your head around because there's not much precedent. There's a lot of precedent for teams ruining programs like that. There's not much precedent for a program doing it so well and then doing it so bad in such a short period. So it's been a tough year for fans for sure. Yeah, that's a great point. And just one instance, Brody, but I think it's one instance that is worth bringing up is the whole John Emery academically ineligible thing. And I have talked to a couple players, former players that have told me, do you know how hard it is to be academically ineligible? I mean, and I'm I was trying to think, well, when was the last one? I can't even remember like when a guy was academically ineligible, smoking a little pot, whatever. Yeah. We hear about that all the time, but this was, that was just another case of, of who's running the show and are, and are they on top of things over there? So. You're exactly right. Or, or even there are plenty of examples of like the guy coming from high school having credit issues, but that's even that that's like a different thing, right? For it's, it's I mean, I talked to some people during that M research that just talked about like, there are just so many things that had to get messed up along the way here to get to that point with the Emory example being a great one. And, and that's true from top to bottom of this program lately. It's just the little things. That's why it's like there was some smoking gun that got Ed Ogeron fired. It was just these little things that just got weaker and weaker and poorly run and just mistakes made and poor PR decision after the next. It's uh, It was a roller coaster for a few years to cover for both of us, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it ended here, unfortunately. So, okay, so I'm sure there'll be people that I go back on all these YouTube chats I've, chats I've done and new LSU coaches was hired and they'll say, well, you were so stupid for talking about this guy, that guy. You know, I was joking today, just like ludicrous stuff, like uh, Pete Carroll will leave the Seahawks yeah. and come back to college football in his 70s to coach LSU, Ed Ogeron's, uh, you know, mentor, you know, crazy things like that. But so we've talked a lot, the, the, the latest and greatest. So Jimbo yesterday, like the first time it got brought up with Jimbo this year, it was not a denial. And I read a lot of incorrect headlines, not on The Athletic, of course, but others saying Jimbo shoots down LSU job. Blah, blah. And I'm like, he didn't really do that. He just yeah. said he likes where he's at and blah, blah. Yesterday, I mean, he said, oh, I'd have to be stupid to leave uh, A&M and these players. And so, of course, we know Brody, he'll step to a podium and say, well, I guess I'm stupid. Uh, here I am as the LSU head coach. But no, I mean, he kind of took himself out and um, Mel Tucker, that seems like it's kind of cooled a little bit. And uh, Lincoln Riley right now, as you and I are sitting here today, uh, is the hot talk at the moment to be like the big splash hire, big brand, young offensive coach from Oklahoma. Yeah, I think the, the toughest thing with coaching searches, I think, and you know this as well, is that, and it's why it's almost like scary to try to report on them is because something can be true and then it changes constantly. Like, you know, Jimbo Fisher, there was a lot of optimism that he might actually, like you said, that first denial wasn't much of a denial. And then, and then you know, there's a lot of optimism he might actually be coming. And then in the past week, and then even leading up to his comments yesterday, kind of seemed like it's going to be a no, at least for now. 
But Lincoln Riley does seem to be, at least from certain people you talk to, the next person that LSU is really, you know, honing in on or really wants. And they'd be silly not to, right? He is probably the best, most respected college coach under 40. You know, he is a rising star prodigy who every NFL team calls every offseason to learn about these modern offenses. Like, he is the guy. He's developed two consecutive number one overall draft picks and Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. You know, he's developed Heisman winners. Like, he is as good of an offensive coach as there is. He's a sharp guy. He's, and he's even got recruiting going at a level Oklahoma wasn't quite at before. So he's a really great coach. And, and there is a lot of a concept that LSU is going to put some big money in front of him and make him say no. The hard part to figure out though, and I won't pretend to know, is how interested is he? You know, there was always this notion for so long that he would only ever leave Oklahoma for the NFL, which made a ton of sense. And I think the NFL, a lot of NFL teams would want him. But I don't know. I just don't know if that's still the case. I don't know if Oklahoma going to the SEC means that all of a sudden Oklahoma is actually not as good of a job as it was because, you know, you're the big 12, you're expected, you can go 11 and one or 12 and 0 every year and make your way to the playoff because you're Oklahoma and there's more there, you know, it's, it's easier to keep it rolling. And all of a sudden Oklahoma goes to the SEC. Hey, they might go up a notch. That's totally possible, but there's also a decent realistic chance that they are now from a, just a pure talent level, you know, probably closer to, let's say if, if number one's Bama two Georgia, and then just pure talent LSU's three, you know, maybe like A&M, Florida, and Oklahoma are in the same bracket. You know, that's yeah. so all of a sudden, not that they're going to be bad, but maybe you go nine and three more often when they would never go nine and three in the Big 12. And I'm not speaking for Lincoln Riley. I have no idea. But I do think there's a chance. That's at least the case you could talk yourself into, I think is the best way to put it, that maybe, you know, LSU might be a better job to him now. Or maybe you offer X amount of money, he can't say no to, it's possible. So yeah. I, I, I don't think I'd rule it out. There's some real optimism in some circles that it's possible, but the hard thing is knowing, yeah, just is that actually doable? And then the question is, who's next? Is it a Matt Campbell at Iowa State? He's a name I've heard tossed around, you know? And like you said, Mel Tucker, he was such a big name in the search for so long. Maybe that was, um, you know, movement and some some savvy playing, and maybe that wasn't that real. Or, or maybe Billy Napier, who seemed like a no for so long, Maybe he's actually a real candidate. Maybe he's actually somebody that's like a nice backup. I don't know. And it's so hard with, you know, as well as I, with Scott Woodward to kind of figure out exactly what he's thinking. Yeah. Uh, and you're exactly right in the fact that something could be true yeah. and, and then it could be changed. For example, I mean, some guy could agree to, to take the job and then somebody reports it. And then it's like, well, I wasn't quite ready to, you know, I needed another 24 hours and it could be screwed up in the, you know, yep. the media reports or whatever. Those the LSU baseball search is the greatest example of that ever. There were four different candidates that were very real and then they fell through. And now people after the fact are like, what are you talking about? It was always Jay Johnson. It's like, it was not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, uh, and uh, well, uh, I almost forgot his name. Joe Oliva uh, told us that Ed Ogeron was the only guy who got an <laughs> offer and uh, you know, Tom Herman, we were not interested in him. Yep. Blah, blah, blah. So, Perfect. I mean, that's what they got to do anyway. But, uh, you know, if, if Scott Woodward, and I know women's basketball is, is not comparable to college football in, in a sense, but if he get Kim Mulkey to leave Baylor, then he can probably, I won't put it past him to pull something off similar in, in college football. We'll see. Um, you talk about Matt Campbell, uh, Brody. I was, I was just kind of glancing at his bio and his win loss record will not I think you you wrote about this. They'll look at his win loss record. You got to realize Iowa State, like you wrote, I think one winning season in ten years before he got yeah. there. His first year, he's three and nine, so he has to kind of you know eat a you know what sandwich to transition to yeah. more wins. And I think he's been the uh, the conference coach of the year three times or something yeah. like that. Um, you know, one thing that I look at it is resume, Brody, that I don't like is he's never coached in the SEC as an assistant. Yeah. Like Mel Tucker has. Um, Napier, Napier was yeah, at Napier Alabama, has, yeah. uh, crystal ball at Oregon, who I, I who I kind of just keep in the back of my mind. I'm like, yeah. he's a guy who has not really been talked about and is just was a monster at Alabama. And I just wonder about him as well. But uh, but yeah, I'd like a coach that had that's been in the SEC a little bit. No, I think that's a valid concern. As, as, and by the way, this all may be a moot point, right? As we know, yeah. some of, any of these names. But but my as much as I believe in Matt Campbell is one of the better young coaches in football. I mean, he's a guy who turned down NFL teams huge money last year. I mean, he's a star. But I get that concern. I mean, the, the one, one thing he's amazing at is evaluation and development. He's incredible at it. I mean, he's developed NFL players. He knows exactly what guys to sign. That's half the battle. 
but still a very real concern to know if he can, you know, he has a history of not chasing those huge recruits. So it's LSU, you have to, you have to chase those big recruits and maybe he'll be even amazing at it. Like he's a good recruiter. So maybe he'll be incredible at it. And maybe he's better than LSU these last 10 years and maybe get in the right big recruits, you know, cause I think that can be a hard part sometimes getting the right character guys. Maybe he's better at that, but maybe mm-hmm. he's not. And that's, what's yeah. so hard. You just don't know, but you know, it's just tough. Cause like you said, he didn't, win a, a big 12 title necessarily but like like iowa state going eight and four is going 11 is going 11 and one at lsu yeah. like it's the same thing and more importantly keeping it steady there that's amazing i mean I, I, there's so many schools that yeah they have a flash in the pan they deserve credit for it but it's stay it's a iowa state right you it's reasonable yeah. to tr- take dips and and he's kept that steady he got a top 10 finish last year so I, I really think he's one of the brighter coaches in football but whether it's a perfect fit at lsu that's a question that's really hard to answer yeah yeah and as we hit the stretch run here uh, if you take a look at the last two guys lsu hired um nick saban was 34 24 and 1 at michigan state and les Good miles point. we know that les has become a much more complicated subject in the last year but he was 28 20 28 and 21 at oklahoma state and we know that he won, you know, 80% of his games or whatever at LSU and won a national title and had a lot of, uh, you know, good to great teams at LSU. Um, so the LSU job, I think, will elevate whoever the coach is to the greatest success of that coach's career. And, uh, and Napier is going to be a fascinating thing to watch because um, I'm from Lafayette and I know just as well as anyone about the dynamics between the Raging Cajuns and, and LSU you know, raging Cajun fans feel like LSU always turns their nose up at us. They think they're better than us. They're arrogant. And then L- I know L- a lot of LSU fans feel like um, uh, the Cajun fans are uh, abrasive. They're aggressive. They, you know, they nag at us. They try to be on our level and they're not and all that. So it would, it would be very interesting. There, there's still a lot of people, Brody, as you know, says we are not hiring the coach of the Cajuns, you know, we're yes. LSU. We don't do that, but Billy Napier, um, I, I can't really say any negative thing about him other than does he need to coach at an Iowa state or something like that in the middle before he comes to the LSU. Yeah. And that's a, a real thing too, right? It, it goes back to the Campbell thing, even though I think they're very different. Like that is a similar thing of needing to prove being able to run a program in group of five and then at the top are just different things. And, and I think that's fair, but like you said, I think they, not all co- my advice to every person ever listening to this stuff is, not all coaches are not all types are made the same, right? It's like Billy Napier is just kind of different. He's a guy who has been under both Dabo Swinney and Nick Saban. He's helped build both Death Stars. You know, he he knows how, to, and that's also true for Mel Tucker too. He's been with Kirby. Like he knows how to do that, but also he knows how to do his own thing. That's the most impressive thing to me because you don't want to go. I don't think LSU is considering it, but I don't think you want to go the hot shot coordinator route. Like that's really risky. But now you have a guy who has been the hotshot coordinator in an Napier, who has helped recruit at the highest levels and then also proved he can win really steadily at a, at a Louisiana. And, and most impressively, like I, to kind of repeat myself, it's not that he was a flash in the pan. It's that he's made the Sun Belt title game four years in a row. And he has them a top 25 team two years in a row. And he knows how to recruit this area. Again, I'm not saying he should be their first or second choice. I don't know. But I think he's a program builder. And I think that's the biggest thing that I think people gloss over in these things. I think it's so easy to be like, who's the exciting coordinator? Who's the guy with the brilliant scheme? And I think that's all fair. But program building is what wins national titles process stuff like that and that's what napier is really really good at so again i don't maybe he needs to go to i don't know tcu first or virginia tech first that's totally fair but i just don't think he should be eliminated because where he's at right now yeah and brody it's a long-term decision not a short-term decision but if you hire billy napier you would think okay obviously the cajuns aren't in a playoff uh, and he knows Louisiana, this stellar recruiting class that LSU is trying to hang on to. I would think he could button that thing up pretty quick um, if he was the, if he was named and um, and everything. So we'll we'll see. It'll be fascinating to watch. It, it's crazy. Um, I feel like we've lived like five lives since uh, that press conference with <laughs> with Ed O and Scott Woodward. This is unprecedented, man. This, this is like to for Coach O to navigate five regular season games when he's already been fired. And LSU hasn't won a game since uh, that Sunday night uh, press conference thing. And for us to, and for the fans to go through this agonizing wait and everything, it's just, um, I, I know Scott Wilber perhaps is thinking, man, this is, we're, we're kind of suffering bad, badly at the moment for the benefit of the future. So hopefully yep. whoever steps to that podium is going to steer this thing back in the, in the right direction. 
Yeah, no, I think you put that well. Yeah, I think it's, I think Scott Woodward is a very big picture thinker. He is not a very reactionary person for the most part. So I think, yeah, he views this as, hey, you, this might stink for a few weeks, but it's about the bigger picture. And I, and I think he won't mind that little dip or anything like that if, if it pays off in the long haul. And that's why he's going to, you know, history shows at least he'll do his due diligence and get the, the right guy. He's been pretty good at hiring before. So, bro, are you telling me that if LSU beats AM, they're not going to say, uh, on second thought, we're bringing Coach O back? I feel uh, pretty gonna... darn confident Ed O'Jean will not be back. I feel quite confident. <laughs> well, good deal. Well, all right, man. I appreciate you joining me. Once again, tell people uh, where, where to find your work and not only your work, but as you said, the hundreds of writers that uh, contribute to the athletic. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you can follow me at, at Brody and Miller on Twitter, but you can subscribe at theathletic.com. I believe if you use my, this link, our podcast link, theathletic.com slash hold that podcast, you should be able to get at least a decent chunk off a of subscription. I mean, it's pretty much the price of a cup of coffee a month. So I think it's worth doing getting hundreds of writers across the whole country. And uh, I recommend it. There it goes. My coffee right here. Yes. My, my toast to Brody and, uh, and to the athletic man. So, uh, Look forward to seeing you soon, man. Keep up the great work. Thanks, thanks for having me, man. A lot of fun. Take care.